What are my go-to brands in terms of quality? I'm going to answer that question plus several more from you guys. Hey everybody, my name's Jimmy. I'm drinking some more of that local coffee that I really like, Black with Two Sugars, and this is Coffee and Trains. This video is brought to you with support from my patrons on Patreon. These videos would not be possible without them. And if you'd like to join the Patreon community, you can follow the link in the description below and join for as little as $1 a month. First of all, you may notice that I am wearing a different shirt than what I typically wear. Did you know that February is American Heart Month? And did you know that women with PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome, are seven times more likely to contract heart disease at some point in their lives? Which is why I'm wearing this Heart for PCOS shirt that my lovely wife got me. Thanks, babe. If you want more information on PCOS, what it can do, all its complications, including heart disease, you can check out the link in the description below. Okay, let's get to some of these questions that you guys have asked me because you have asked me a lot of them. And I want to start off with one from Andy Crawford. He says, how would you build a helix? I would be very interested in your planning and technique. Well, I do want to build a helix at some point. I, I have an expansion plan that one of them does involve a helix. And what I basically would do, first of all, SCARM is a great way to plan out a helix. And what I would be looking for is probably right around a 2% grade going up. So, and I'd want the radius to clear be able to clear two inches around each loop. And basically the way I would do it is I would use either masonite or very thin uh, plywood like underlayment or something. And then I would just have two inch blocks that would just, I would just sit there and glue them and nail them in place and then keep going up and up and up and up and up. But in terms of planning it, SCARM is gonna be a great way. I know that the radius that I shoot for when I do a helix is right around 18 inches. That's what I'm gonna do when I, when I, if I decide to build a helix. But that's my typical way of planning it is SCARM is a really great way. And I think I need to do probably a more in-depth video with SCARM to show some of these things. But thank you so much for that question. Andy. Our next question comes from Doug Corto and he says, Hey, love the YouTube channel. How do you decide on era? Also, what are ranking of brand and quality? First of all, the era I decided on modern is partially decided because of the fact that I did in scale and in scale is a lot more prolific with diesels than it is with steam and there's there's just some issues with steam and how small it is and how the parts move so diesel and the modern era typically tends to be more of what in scale is but i also am a child of the 90s so i grew up with the big norfolk southern trains going i live in norfolk southern country and i can remember being in preschool and there was a track that went uh, across the road from the preschool and every time a train would go by we would run up to and we start kicking the fence i don't know why we'd kick the fence but that's what we would do every time a train would go by so that's what really like weighed in on deciding the era now in terms of brand quality now i'm only going to speak to in scale even though some of these do have ho scale and um, i really have three that i buy the most of and the three that i buy the most of are the the high end the high tier the nicest locomotive that i own is a scale trains rivet counter and that thing is super nice it is super detailed and is super realistic and i absolutely love it now my two brands that i buy the most in terms of my bulk of my equipment are Kato for more locomotives and bulk rolling stock and things like that. Um, they definitely don't have as much rolling stock as some other companies. And the other company I buy a lot of actually is Atlas. Um, Atlas is just, it's very, very solid. Um, I have a Dash 8 that's running my new maintenance of weight train and it is a great locomotive. I got it with DCC and sound. I got a deal on it. So those are my three big brands. Now, one that I consider really solid that I think a lot of people have a sour taste in their mouth. And I've actually done a whole video about this kind of thing. Um, is Bachman. I think Bachman makes some really solid stuff. They used to make something that was a bit more toyish and and things like that, but but they've really come along and they're and they're rolling stock and their locomotives are really quite detailed. Obviously the starter set stuff is is not. It's it's very basic, but when you're buying the individual locomotives and rolling stock, they really look quite nice and they're really quite detailed. So um one that is really expensive that I'm not 
too keen on, and it's just probably my personal experience, is Broadway Limited. I have two Broadway Limiteds in my collection, and um, I don't even want to sell them because they really don't run that well. Um, they're very herky-jerky, and um, I know I'm not the only person to have this problem with it. These are Broadway Limited diesels. They're not steams. I haven't tried any of the steam locomotives in N-Scale, but um, I have an SD70 and a GE, for one of the Norfolk Southern Heritage locomotives. So those, uh, I probably won't buy another um, Broadway Limited, but let's see here. Thank you so much for that question, Doug. The next question we are going to have is from Christopher Pretzman. He says, have you tried to connect Cotto Gunderson well cars? What a pain. Would you, I would love to see you here if you've encountered this. And actually I have, I own two sets of the Cotto uh, Gunderson well cars. For those of you that don't know, they come in five packs and they share trucks. And this is where it really kind of gets finicky and they tend to, they're really difficult to connect because they're designed to just stay together, but and like they're just not easy to put together. And if you don't do them right, they really are prone to derailment. And I've had a lot of derailments with them, but I figured out a few things with them. So one, the couplers at the ends of these are truck mounted. So some body mounted locomotives are going to have uh, body mounted couplers on locomotives are going to hit and cause issues, especially on tighter radii. And I've had that issue, so using a buffer car at the beginning is something that I have started doing. I'm eventually going to purchase some uh, standalone well cars to be my buffer cars so that there's no real difference. And the other thing that I've noticed is that if you look at the trucks themselves, because the trucks are independent of the uh, well cars, they, they completely detach. Uh, one side is different than the other, and if you're having a lot of derailments with these trucks, um, with these well cars, um, try reversing the trucks, and that, that seems to help out and uh, make it run a lot smoother. Usually, I'll have one or two that keep derailing at certain spots, and it's the same spot, and once I flip those trucks around, it works fine. So... Those are my solutions that I have found. I know we've also had these um, private conversations on uh, my Patreon page because he is a patron. and uh, But those are uh, my solutions for those Cotto Gunderson cars. Next one is from a guy who is new into the hobby. Uh, David Hellman says that he is totally new to model railroading. He's building a 6x8 layout and he's in the process of trying to figure out uh, track planning. He's doing Lionel, so O scale. He's got that fast track with uh, 031, 036. And he asked me if I could do a video explaining the difference between switches and turnouts. Well, I don't think I need to do an entire video. They're basically, the mechanism is the same. They're either diverting or bringing together tracks. Um, but the real thing is, is really the switches, turnouts, uh, also people over in Europe call them points. Um, these are basically, they're, they're all the same thing. One of the big differences though, when you have, in terms of actual like products, you have what are called snap switches, which are, have a curve and a straight. So a snap switch will be um, equal to a radius. So you'll have it like an 18 inch radius snap switch for uh, HO scale, 22 inch radius for HO scale. Um, you'll have the 031 and the 036 radius snap switches. Now these go along with a curve. Now when you look at turnouts, you'll see like a number four, number five, number six. These are the ratios of like how much it diverges. It doesn't go off on a curve. It just kind of diverges at a straight. So when you have a number four turnout, for example, you're going to have, that's going to be for every four feet that the track goes straight, it's going to diverge one foot. So that's just an example of a number five, one to five, a number six, one to six. You kind of, kind of get that. So that's the real, when you're looking at the products themselves, when it says um, snap switch, the snap switches typically go out on the, the curves and the turnouts are just doing the diverging. So thank you so much for that question, David. Let's see here. Who do we have? Have next, we have Doug Whetstone. Doug Whetstone says, how many turnouts can be attached to one motor driver? And let's see here. I think I actually have a couple of these right here. Yes, I do. And I have something else right here that I can grab. So this is the motor driver that he is talking about. This is an L298N motor driver. And I use these to control my Kato 
turnouts, but they can be used for other things as well, as I'll talk about in a second. But you can see that these have four control pins, which basically the first two control pins control one side and the other two control another side. So this thing is meant to control two motors at the same time. So you have two different terminals that will uh, control two separate motors. So you can do two Kato turnouts at the same time, but you can also do, and I just dropped it, you can do tortoise switch machines with these as well. I actually just finished testing it out making sure that it was good to go. So, um, but you can do tortoise switch machines with these. So you can control two tortoises per motor driver. So thank you, Doug, for that question. Before we get to our final question, I wanna go over some of the coffees that you guys are drinking. Let's see here, Bitmap says that he's actually drinking chai tea um, from, uh, from powder in a tin because he can't have coffee at the moment. Sorry about that, but chai tea is pretty good. It's one of my favorite holiday drinks. Let's see here. RMS Teutonic, I think that's probably, that may be like a play on words for Titanic, says that he is drinking uh, ginger beer, um, not a ginger beer coffee. That would be weird. <laughs> yeah, it would be a little weird. So I'll accept that. And last but not least, Mill Run and Western says that he's drinking eight o'clock coffee paired up with some no bake cookies. That sounds really, really, really good. Well, thank you guys so much. If you want to have your coffees mentioned on this, you can leave them in the comments below. Our last question comes from Luis Vila. And he says, I have an old analog train layout. Is there an easy way to change to DCC? Well, this is, it's got, it's got two parts in it. In short, if we're talking about the control system, yes, it's fairly easy to switch. If we're talking about the locomotives, it really depends. If you have a bunch of old non-DCC ready locomotives, get ready for a lot of soldering and things like that. So in short, no, it's not going to be easy to change non-DCC ready locomotives to DCC. You can do it, and there are decoders that are made do, to do this, and I'm thinking about trying it by buying some old locomotives off eBay and seeing if I can do it, but it's not the easiest thing in the world. In terms of the power system, yes, it's very, very easy to do this. You just have to make sure that your wires aren't crossed and things like that, but DCC wiring, if you're looking at one-to-one -one in terms of feeders and everything, is actually simpler than DCC wiring, believe it or not. So to answer your question, yes, it is easy to change to DCC in terms of your power system. It's just plug and play pretty much for the most part if you've wired um, a lot of uh, DC, if you've done all the feeders and everything. And if for non-DCC ready locomotives, you're gonna have some more difficulty. Well, if you guys want to have some questions answered on this, you can leave them in the comments below or you can send me a message, whatever. So I wanna try to do this once a month. I I want to say thank you guys so so much for watching Be sure to check out that link for pcos awareness during american heart month heart for pcos thank you guys so so much for watching until next time i'm jimmy from the diy and digital stay safe be kind drink some coffee and happy railroading